I know some of them might as well be. <laughs> uh, they, they have very diverse uh, qualities to them. I've got some players who are absolute min-maxer munchkin guys who will go and look for every broken thing that you've ever published. Uh, and some stuff that we never publish. Uh, it, it's true. Some of, my, some of my players are game designers, so they pull their stuff from the complete book if I just made it up. <laughs> uh, I don't pay enough attention to what their powers do to, to know one way or the other, and that's fine. Uh, we can tell that someone's broken. Uh, but it's, it's really their game. I'm just <coughs> facilitating it and having a good time doing it. Great. Well, we were never teenagers in this campaign. When we started, I was 26, I think. All my players were in their mid to late 20s at that point. So, and in a way, that's kind of the, one of the secrets to the longevity of the campaign. Is I kind of bypass the time of everyone's lives when, you, when their lives are going through upheavals. You know, the people were, for the large part, done moving and done, you know, changing careers and things like that. Um, and so I've had a remarkably stable time with it. Um, I think somewhat because of that. I mean, that's not a particularly useful piece of advice. Oh, well, just ignore teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> But no, in our, so I would we've been remarkably constant in what my players want individually. They sometimes want different things. Like you were saying, some of them are very <clears throat> min maxi. Kevin. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and some of them are very, I would say, rules of verse, but they would rather just not think about it too much and let the more rule savvy people help them with their character sheets and remind them what to roll when. And so I try to, you know, to not, you know, put any pressure on those people to feel like they have to worry about the rules. I try to take care of things for them. Kevin is very good about that with, with a couple of the players that we have like that. He has, makes all these little numeric charts so that they know, you know, they don't have to recompute things all the time because they otherwise might. Um, but no, they wanted, we, Again, like you were saying, the, uh, we, before the campaign started, we, I made sure that everyone was kind of bought into what I wanted to do, and that they were going to enjoy what I wanted to do, and if they wanted something different, that I would change it, because, yes, it, it, nothing will derail a campaign, I imagine, like, like a disparity between what the players want out of it and what the DM wants out of it. That's just not going to survive anything at the time. Yeah, if you, if you want political entry, then you give them D&D Waterworld. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing that's changed, I you know, just thinking about my own arc as a player, you know, since the you know early 80s, um, technology. I mean, have you guys introduced computers at the desktop, I mean, computers at the tabletop, or iPads, or Skype, or, I mean, any of that? Definitely. Uh, once email came along, the ability to pass notes to your DM really took on a whole new uh, uh, capacity. And uh, the first Zoom campaign, which was the only one that I ran, uh, a lot of the game started to happen almost behind the scenes where the players were sending me notes. And then you'd come to the table and people would have these different contexts because not everybody had the whole picture. And it started to get really interesting. Uh, it occasionally got very. Uh, Brought with, uh, with tension at the table as people like, how do you know that, or how do you know this, or... But it was fun, it was, it was, it was really exciting, but email was a big, big change. My so players like rely on Twitter to tell them what to do now, they just... <laughs> 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 like, what should I do? Tweet? Should I do? I don't know. I have, a, I have a friend who lives in Beijing, China, who still plays 2nd edition D&D with his yeah. old game group every week. And he does it by his style. Um, which I think is pretty amazing. We actually had two of my players uh, who were married recently had their first child. And it's been really hard for them necessarily to get the games on time, they have a tough commute to get to my house. Um, and so we've had a couple games now where, you know, they, if the kid's fussy or what have you, they stay at home, they Skype in, I stick my laptop up at the end of the table with some speakers on it and the webcam pointing towards the table. I wouldn't want to do it every day. I mean, it isn't quite as good as them being there, but it's way better than them being really late or not being able to be there at all. Do you imagine a world where you start doing more and more of this stuff virtually? I mean, it, it's a topic of heavy conversation among almost every RPG nerd I know. It's not what I love the most. Like, I want, I want to be there with my friends and be able to see their faces and hear their laughter um, and throw things at them across the table. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you still
sort of say that with a joke, but um, we were talking a little earlier about the level of investment people have in a campaign that's run this long. And it, is it the case that it's sort of a more serious game, less jocular, no drinking, you know, straight up focus on the story at hand? I mean, because one of the great things about, for instance, one shots is you don't care whether you die. <laughs> Captain. You need to kind of pick your spots at the table and kind of gauge the mood of the room even after all that time. Sometimes, you know, people have come with really hard days of work, you know, they're just, they, they need to blow off some steam, you know, and it's fine to just like let people move around at the table and not take things too seriously. And there are other times, you know, if you've gotten to a dramatic point in the story where you really just want people to focus so they're going to miss something important or, you know, you know, they're going to be sad later if they realize they didn't take a certain thing seriously. It's good to focus on them, that's fine, but I don't think there's any reason to be dogmatic about it. And there's nothing inherent in the game, even after 15 years, that says, oh, God, I have to take this really seriously. In fact, I think that might grind people down to the point where they started having a lot less fun if they thought that I was purposefully taking the levity out of it. There was one of Doreen's games where a rift opened up. Uh, Space and time, and a jungle, and we sort of superimposed the jungle, and there happened to be a monkey there. Um, and Dory had a wonderful plot, a very exciting encounter, all laid out. No, what we insisted on was an hour and a half of monkey impressions. <laughs> Only in an hour and a half. <laughs> so at the end of the session, Lulu goes, we said that was a fantastic game. Did did you plan on that? And he just looked at us and sort of shook his head and said, there is no monkey in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the potential for the running joke after uh, like yeah. 10 years. Um, yeah, I can reduce, there are five people on this planet that I can reduce to helpless tears by doing this. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to do, get around. Wouldn't it be cool if this whole panel just degenerated into monkey impersonation? <laughs>